A gas is a fluid, much as you think of a liquid as being a fluid. It can flow and have turbulence and other fluid properties. The main difference between a gas and a fluid and a liquid as a fluid is that a liquid has a fixed volume, whereas a gas can expand to fill whatever volume of container it's been placed in. Now some of the distinctions between their different properties, liquids tend to be much higher density compared to gases. In fact, a, a gas will tend to occupy about a thousand times the volume of a liquid under atmospheric pressures. So if you take a liter of water and convert it into steam, you expect about a thousand liters of steam to be generated. Liquids are much higher viscosity compared to gases. And this all has to do with the fact that their molecules are held together by significant attractions, which prevent them from wandering off into the, the void of the container. Whereas for a gas, the molecules are able to move freely. The attractions are not strong enough to keep the molecules together under whatever conditions our gas is existing at. Because molecular attractions play such a small role for gases, they're not strong enough to hold the molecules together, a very useful simplification can be to simply ignore their existence entirely. And the really major advantage of that is that then it no longer matters which gas we have in our container. Whether it's argon or helium or something else, we're gonna be able to model it the same way. So the way we model it is as an ideal gas. So this is our simplified picture of gas in which we completely ignore all attractions between the molecules. We're gonna imagine that our gas particles collide elastically. That means they just bounce off of each other and they bounce off the walls of the container. And the energy and the momentum of the particles is conserved. And we're also going to imagine that these ideal gas particles have no volume. So we're not gonna to have to worry about different varying molecular sizes. So the advantages of this, it's a very good approximation for a large number of gases. It's especially a good approximation at high temperatures. This is where the molecules have a lot of energy when they collide into each other, which makes their collisions very elastic, which was one of our assumptions. It's also a very good approximation at low pressures. With low pressures, we have very few molecules bouncing into each other fairly rarely. And so we have very few interactions that makes it an intrinsically good approximation to say that there are no attractions between the molecules because the molecules might not even bounce into each other regardless of what their makeup is. Now there are some disadvantages. This is not as good of an approximation if our molecules are large or if they have very strong attractions. Water vapor is an example of something with strong internal attractions between the molecules doesn't work as well at low temperatures where the molecules are very close together and they don't have the energy to have highly elastic collisions. And it also doesn't work well at high pressures where again the molecules are very close together. It also is not going to be able to model things like phase transition. So for example where a gas converts into a liquid or a gas converts into a solid. That is not built into the ideal gas model. And so if we need to include that information in our model because we're transitioning between the, the temperatures at which our gas condenses, then we're gonna to have to use a, a different picture in order to represent it. A nice thing about ideal gases is that it's very easy to characterize their properties. And we're especially gonna be interested in their pressure and their temperature and their volume and how it relates to how many moles of the gas are present. Now pressure, the technical definition, is it's the amount of force per unit of area. So basically how much the gas is going to push against the walls of whatever container that we've put it in. Now our units of pressure, the average air pressure at sea level defines the atmosphere, or ATM, and one atmosphere is defined to be equal to 760 millimeters of mercury which is the same unit as a tor, 760 tor, which would be 14.7 pounds per square inch, as we sometimes use in the United States. The actual SI unit is pascals, 
which is newtons per square meter. So one atmosphere is equal to 101,325 pascals or 1.01325 bar. Now this is one case where we often prefer non-SI units because our laboratories are usually at one atmosphere pressure or something pretty close to it. So that makes atmospheres really useful and convenient. And our barometers that measure the pressure usually do so in millimeters of mercury because they're mercury barometers. And so that makes millimeters of mercury a really handy unit. And so we'll often find ourselves in these non-SI units instead of these SI units. And physicists would probably actually use Pascals, but we're going to often deviate from that. Now you'll sometimes see a problem state that we are at standard temperature and pressure conditions. So the standard temperature should be zero degrees Celsius, which is 273.15 in the Kelvin scale. And the standard pressure is 100 kilopascals. And there's been a changeover. There's an older definition of standard temperature and pressure where the standard pressure is one atmosphere. And we've switched over to the SI system. So now we define it to be 100 kilopascals. Well, 100 kilopascals is not that far off from an atmosphere, right? One atmosphere is equal to 101 kilopascals. That's only about a percentage difference, 1%. So sometimes I'll state that a problem is at standard temperature and pressure, and I'll just go ahead and use one atmosphere even though it's not technically correct, but it's going to be correct within a percentage. And so if accuracy is not extremely important, that can be an okay approximation. Now to understand how pressure applies to an ideal gas, let's start by considering a very simple scenario where we have a container as a lid of area A and it has just a single particle in the container. So this particle collides with the lid and then it bounces back the other direction and just keeps bouncing back and forth. So the pressure on this lid here is going to be the force from that collision of the particle in the lid divided by the area of the lid. Now what's going to happen if we instead have two particles in our container? So we double the total number of particles. Well, it's probably reasonably evident that we're going to double the number of collisions, and so we're going to double the force in the lid. We're going to therefore double the pressure. And I think it's probably just as obvious that if we put three particles in here, we would triple the pressure. If we put four particles in, we quadruple the pressure. And so the way we can write that is we can write that pressure is proportional to the number of particles, which we will represent with n for number. Now, another way we can write a proportionality is we can replace this symbol with an equal sign and just include a proportionality constant. So in this case, that constant is gonna represent whatever the pressure per particle is. So if n was equal to one, our pressure would just be equal to k. And if n was equal to two, now our pressure is gonna be equal to twice that value. It's gonna be equal to two k. So this is how we represent our insight that pressure is proportional to the number of particles in our container. All right, well, what if we change the scenario a different way? What if we double the volume of the container? Well, what's gonna happen here is that our particle, which is bouncing back and forth, is now gonna have twice as far for its trip. And so it's going to strike the lid half as often and because we're going to have half as many collisions, we're going to have half as much force, so we're going to have half as much pressure. Now this is a little bit different than our previous relationship. In this case, when the volume goes up, the pressure goes down, and so that's an inverse proportion. So we write that the pressure is proportional to one over the volume. And so if we start off with one liter volume and we increase it to two liters, now this will be one over two. So our pressure will be one half, just like our, our insight was here. If we double the volume, we have half as many collisions because it takes twice as long to make the trip. And likewise, if it was three times the volume, then we'd have one third the pressure, etc. 
One last consideration. What if we double the temperature? I'm gonna to have to give you a little piece of information here. The information I need to give you is that the kinetic energy, this is the motion energy of our particles, is directly proportional to the temperature. So if we double the temperature, we double the kinetic energy. What that means is that we're gonna be doubling the force with which the particle strikes the lid of our container. And so again, we are going to wind up doubling the pressure. So now we can write that the pressure is proportional to the temperature. If we have twice the temperature, we'll have twice the pressure. We can combine these three insights together into a single expression. So if pressure is proportional to the number of particles and the temperature and inversely proportional to the volume, then we can just throw those all together. Pressure is proportional to the number times the temperature divided by the volume. And we might go ahead and for convenience multiply both sides by the volume. So we have the pressure times the volume is proportional to the number of particles times the temperature. Now remember we can replace this proportionality with a constant and turn it into an equation. So if we measure the constant of proportionality, we're gonna call this R for whatever historical reasons. And if, if our units are liters of volume and atmospheres of pressure and kelvins of temperature and moles of molecules, then R is equal to 0 0.082057. Now we can write the ideal gas law in its most common form, which is that the pressure times the volume is equal to the number of particles times R, which is always gonna be this value, times the temperature in kelvins. And the temperature does always have to be in kelvins. It won't work if it's in Celsius or some other scale. Well, suppose that we have a 700 milliliter flask and this flask contains argon gas. The temperature is 25 degrees Celsius, and the pressure inside of our flask is 648 millimeters of mercury, which is also 648 torr. So how much argon is in a container? Well, since we're trying to calculate the quantity of argon, usually we calculate quantities of substances using moles. So let's start by trying to figure out how many moles of argon we have. Now to do that, we can use our PV equals NRT equation, but we need to make sure we're in the right units. So we're gonna to convert to our units of our constant R, which was liters and atmospheres and kelvins and moles. So we're given this temperature of 25 degrees Celsius, that needs to be in kelvins. Remember, kelvin scale is shifted by 273.15. So we just add that to our temperature in Celsius. And then remember when we went through all those different kinds of pressures, we said that for every one atmosphere, we had 760 millimeters of mercury. So that's our conversion factor we can multiply by. So millimeters of mercury will cancel and we'll be left with atmospheres. We get 0.853 atmospheres. And then finally, our volume was in milliliters. We need it to be in liters. So that should work out to 0.7 liters. Now that we have the correct units, we can go ahead and use our PV equals NRT. We'll go ahead and solve for N because that's the quantity we want, number of moles. And go ahead and plug in all of our numbers that we came up with. And we can verify here that all of our units are gonna cancel out. So atmospheres cancels with atmospheres, liters cancels with liters, Kelvins, cancels with Kelvins. Now, moles here, note that we divided by moles in this quantity, but that whole quantity down here, we're also dividing by. Well, when you divide by something twice, that's the same thing as multiplying by it. If you divide by one half, which is 0.5, you get two. So this is going to flip moles back up into the numerator, which is good, we need that to happen since moles is what we're trying to measure. So we get units of 0.0244 moles of argon. Now our last step, we usually like to get our quantities in masses. 
since that's what we can actually measure. So we calculated the number of moles. Now we could multiply by the weight of argon from the periodic table, which is 39.95 grams per mole. Moles cancels, and we get 0.976 grams of argon. So in this entire 700 milliliter flask, there's about just one gram of argon. Another consideration will be if we wind up changing our quantities. So for example, we increase in pressure or we decrease in temperature or we inject additional gas molecules into our container. Then we're going to want to be able to figure out what our new pressure or our new temperature or our new quantity of molecules has to be. The way we're going to do this is we're still going to use PV equals nRT. We're going to use it twice, once to indicate the initial conditions and once to indicate the final conditions. So we can write down the equation twice. And for instance, let's say that we know the initial volume and we know the initial temperature and we know the final temperature maybe and we are trying to find what the final volume would be. So in that case, in our first equation, we'll go ahead and label the volume and temperature of ones. And in our second equation, we'll label the volume and temperature of twos. And now we can combine these equations together. Now the way that we're going to combine these equations is that we're going to go ahead and divide them by each other. So the left hand side of the equations will divide by each other and the right hand side of the equations will divide by each other. And we can do that because they're equal quantities. And so what's going to happen is that our quantities that we're not interested in, these pressures and these number of moles and our constant R, none of which change, are all going to go away. And we get a new equation which is going to relate the quantities that we are interested in. Then the last thing that we need to do is go ahead and solve for whatever our desired quantity is. Let's say that we have a balloon and the initial conditions for this balloon, we've inflated it to 50 milliliters under four atmospheres of pressure. And we did this at 10 degrees Celsius. Maybe this is on some alien planet and then we take it back to Earth, where there's a pressure of one atmosphere and the temperature is 20 degrees Celsius. Well, if this is a very flexible balloon, what's going to be the new volume? Well, first of all, we'll go ahead and do as we said. We'll write PV equals nRT twice. And we know the initial volume, and we know the initial pressure, and we know the initial temperature. So we're going to label those variables with subscripts of one. And now we know the final pressure and we know the final temperature and we are looking for the final volume. So we're going to label all of those variables with subscripts of two. Now we're going to divide those equations, the left hand sides and the right hand sides. So the n's will cancel out and the r's will cancel out and we'll get this equation right here. Now what we're interested in is the final volume, this V2 here. So we can go ahead and solve for V2. When we do that we get P1 times V1 times the second temperature is equal to P2 times T1. Now if we plug in our quantities, our initial pressure and our initial volume times our second temperature, remember we always have to convert in the kelvins, divided by the initial, or sorry, the second pressure and the initial temperature in kelvins. We can check here the atmospheres will cancel out, kelvins will cancel out, and milliliters, it's fine here that it's milliliters instead of liters. It's only the temperature that we always have to convert. Here, we're just going to get an answer in milliliters instead of liters. And so this comes out to 207 milliliters. So just a little bit more than four times our initial volume.